Thanks very much for that kind introduction. It's, it's really a pleasure to, to be here right in the neighborhood. Uh, I, I'm a neighbor in more ways than one. I uh, am, uh, of course, right across the street at NIH. Make sure all my gadgets are on here. Okay, thank you. And also live about uh, three or four blocks from here. So I pass by on all kinds of occasions. I've been in the ER with kids with broken arms and dog bites and the, the, the whole thing. But so it's, it's great to be here and talk with you about a subject that I have been um, immersed in over the past uh, year in particular in the context of a task force which was put together by the International Society of Psychiatric Genetics uh, in order to put together some guidelines uh, in a statement that would help uh, guide clinicians and the public about the use of something that um, maybe 10 years ago seemed like a distant fiction, but which is with us today now, that is uh, genetic testing uh, in psychiatry. So I want to talk a little bit about the issues pertaining to genetic testing today. I, I call the, the talk uses and misuses of genetic testing in psychiatry, uh, partly for dramatic effect, but also to, to emphasize that this is still very much an evolving area uh, where uh, sometimes the practice has gotten uh, way ahead of the data and uh, where, where we're scrambling to, to catch up uh, in understanding how people think about these tests, um, how they use the information that comes out of them, and whether uh, that information is actually uh, going to improve patient care. So here's an outline of my talk today. I'll talk a little bit about the potential value of genetic information in psychiatry, some of the key questions in evaluating genetic tests, uh, review some of the currently available tests, and also the, uh, the recent ISPG guidelines, and lay out some of the new challenges we face for clinical practice, also for education and research. So genetic testing is important in psychiatry, as it is in most fields of medicine, because of what it might be able to tell us. Uh, it might tell us about differential diagnosis, an area uh, where in psychiatry in particular, uh, we have uh, grappled with the challenges of diagnoses that are based purely on clinical syndromes uh, without reliable biomarkers or other laboratory assays. Genetic testing might also help us in prediction of treatment outcomes. Uh, a recent uh, uh, article on, uh, on the series NOVA uh, asserted that most uh, psychiatric treatment is a trial and error basis. I'm not sure that I would agree with that entirely, but it does underscore the difficulties we have uh, in deciding what is the best treatment for each individual patient. And genetic information that might uh, indicate who's most likely to respond, or even more importantly, who's mo most likely to have an adverse event, could obviously help a lot, uh, even if it only uh, illuminates a, a proportion of cases. Finally, it would be helpful if we could identify individuals who are at high risk for serious psychiatric disorders. Uh, this would allow us uh, to carry out primary prevention research and actually measure the outcomes uh, from various interventions, and also might, down the road, uh, enable psychiatrists to employ truly preventive strategies. Uh, for example, uh, what we could do to, to prevent the, the full onset of schizophrenia uh, in an individual who's presenting with prodromal symptoms. So these are just some of the potential uses for genetic testing in psychiatry. For most cases, we're not there yet, but in some cases, uh, we're beginning to, uh, to, to touch upon uh, some of these areas. Now, whenever we talk about genetic testing, like with most laboratory tests, uh, it's important to remember three key questions. First of all, uh, can the marker be genotyped reliably? This is what uh, is called analytic validity, and it's generally well established for single marker assays that are available through commercial or hospital-based or, or CLIA-based laboratories, but actually it's much less certain for assays that are based on next-generation sequencing, uh, generating the entire uh, exomic or whole genome sequence on an individual, which is a prospect that uh, in the not-too-distant future uh, might be an option for, for many people who are coming into the hospital. Uh, while these next-generation sequencing technologies are um, very efficient and very inexpensive uh, compared to 
what it cost to sequence a genome just a few years ago, there's still entire regions of the genome that are not well captured. Uh, and there's also a, a significant problem of false positive findings. Once we get past analytical validity, the question comes up of how valid <coughs> is the association between the genetic marker and the disease. This is uh, a, uh, an area known as clinical validity. And here, uh, the, the sample size of the tests that we use to establish the initial association and the replication of, uh, of those findings in independent samples are the key indicators of a valid association. But we also have to remember, particularly for findings that might come out of genome-wide association studies, is the genetic markers that are identified might not actually be uh, the underlying functional genetic variants. And actually, for relatively few of the tests that are available based on genome-wide association findings to date, has the functional allele been identified. So what you're looking at instead is a marker that reflects a nearby uh, genetic variation. And the degree to which those two uh, variations correlate might actually vary from person to person. And finally, and this is probably the most important question for a clinician, is does the test result have any clinical utility? It is, will it really change the way you diagnose or manage a patient? And here, it's very difficult actually to predict up front uh, which tests are going to have the greatest clinical utility. Even a test that have very large effect sizes uh, and seem to provide unique information beyond what we could obtain through uh, physical exam and family history uh, don't actually prove to have clinical utility when tested empirically in randomized trials. And very few clinical tests uh, based on genetic findings have so far been through that sort of rigorous randomized clinical trial evaluation. Another important question, of course, along the lines of clinical utility, and one that's particularly relevant in psychiatry, is do alternative treatments or diagnoses exist? It doesn't do much good uh, to, to have a genetic test that tells us a patient's less likely to respond to a particular treatment if there are no good alternative treatments available. So when I gave a talk on psychiatric genetics 10 years ago, I might have had one slide on genetic testing as, as a distant future prospect. Uh, but actually, here we are in 2014, and, and actually genetic testing is already here in psychiatry in a variety of different forms. Uh, commercial panels are marketed to psychiatrists and psychologists to look for things like recurrent copy number variants that have been associated with developmental disorders such as autism. Uh, markers of the cytochrome P450 system, which I'll be talking some more about in a few moments, that are uh, presumed to give information about drug response and adverse events. And the uh, linked polymorphic region of the serotonin transporter, which has been variously marketed for a whole range of psychiatric and psychiatric treatment outcomes. Like it or not, there's also direct marketing to patients and their relatives. This is something that's uh, gotten some news coverage in recent months when the Food and Drug Administration issued uh, a warning to a company, uh, 23andMe, that was providing genetic testing uh, directly marketed to individuals and making health claims associated with that. These are generally based on SNP arrays, uh, but actually we're, we're also moving into the era where commercially available exome sequence is being provided. Now, the most commonly used tests that are currently available through clinical laboratories are tests that you'll generally be familiar with. There are the common risk alleles such as APOE4, uh, which uh, uh, is associated with the risk of late onset Alzheimer's disease. There are the copy number variants, which can be ordered uh, usually on array tests as part of the workup of neurodevelopmental disorders. It's possible to look for recurrent uh, CNVs, those that are known and are already uh, 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 represented on existing panels, as well as de novo CNVs comparing the, ge the genome in the affected offspring to that of both parents. We've also long had the ability to test for rare risk alleles, such as those that cause phenylketonuria, expanded repeats that cause things like Huntington disease, as well as uh, traditional cytogenetics, which only occasionally comes up uh, in routine psychiatric practice. Uh, although we nevertheless often do uh, treat individuals who ha have 
uh, cytogenetically based disorders such as a Down syndrome. So uh, these long established tests generally look at chromosomal and genetic lesions that can be considered causal. I mentioned phenylketonuria, Huntington disease, fragile X syndrome. Individuals who carry these well-defined uh, genetic lesions uh, can be thought of, uh, uh, of having their disease as a result of that genetic change. But we're now into a realm where more recently developed genetic tests are actually looking at things that can be best characterized as genetic risk factors that are not causal. That is, carrying the genetic marker is uh, neither necessary nor sufficient to develop the disease, and a whole range of other factors, often not fully understood, play a role in who will fall ill. This is certainly true of the APOE, Association with Alzheimer's Disease, uh, where, for example, individuals who carry the high-risk E4 allele have only a slightly increased risk of disease unless they have an affected first-degree relative. Particular lifestyle factors also play a role in that. Uh, copy number variants that have been associated with autism and schizophrenia seem to show many of the same characteristics. Uh, a recent study out of Iceland, which looked at a large population uh, of individuals who carried these variants, found that in most cases they weren't identified as psychiatric patients, although if they were carefully assessed, they often had various kinds of cognitive impairments. And finally, uh, the, the cytochrome P450 variations which are uh, typically used uh, to make predictions about drug metabolism, but again are not, uh, not determinative uh, either of that meta metabolism or, more importantly, of the treatment outcome. At the same time, uh, consumers can directly order off the internet uh, single nucleotide arrays uh, that um, are often uh, presented along with health implications based on genome-wide association study findings, uh, reporting that someone is at a 1 or 2 percent increased risk or a 3 or 4 percent decreased risk of this or that common disease. Uh, some of these companies also are, offer results uh, on Mendelian disorders, including uh, uh, rare mutations in the BRCA gene, which is, can cause uh, early onset breast cancer, APOE, I already mentioned. And uh, the marketing in the health claims is pretty tightly regulated or prohibited in some countries, but in others is still uh, uh, pretty wide open. In the case of 23andMe, although they are now no longer able to directly market health claims to new customers, uh, health reports based on existing customers' uh, data are still provided. We're also now into the realm where sequence, either exome or whole genome, is offered. Obviously, this is to a very small portion of the population who are able to afford uh, the, the, the thousands of dollars this typically costs, uh, but this falls under a, uh, a rubric of personal genomes, which is actually gaining uh, some popularity with certain segments of the, of the younger population, as well as other products uh, that are based on one or a few individual assays. So we're now already into a climate where there's uh, a large variety of tests that are looking at different things which have very different meanings uh, depending on the context in which they are uh, provided and where clinicians no longer have a monopoly on that information. So from a psychiatrist's point of view, this is anxiety provoking. <laughs> and uh, uh, as a result, I think we need to really get up to steam on this and make sure that, that we know what our patients uh, are, are thinking when they come in uh, to the office with a genetic question. So these are some of the, the uh, direct-to-consumer ads that you can find on the internet. This is one that was meant to pick up um, markers of suicidal ideation. This one, I think, has already gone under. Uh, this is the uh, website for 23andMe, which modestly puts the company's um, history in the context of uh, Gregor Mendel's discovery of the laws of inheritance uh, and the completion of the uh, human genome product uh, project. And this is one of the newer uh, companies known as Gentle, uh, and uh, this actually offers uh, a whole exome sequencing, the transcribed portion of the genome, and is targeted particularly at expectant mothers uh, who might be worried about 1,700 or more diseases 
that could be passed along to their children. Uh, interestingly, this company uh, uh, does claim that they provide genetic counseling as part of the product that they're offering, which is an interesting claim. It's, it's not, uh, not directly provided, at least not professional counseling, with any of the other companies, as far as I'm aware. I'll be talking about that issue more in a few minutes. So much of the direct-to-consumer genetic testing, in particular, occurs outside of the usual context of informed consent. But we might also uh, ask ourselves, in psychiatry, when we provide a, a genetic test to patients, uh, are we uh, thinking carefully about informed consent? Uh, this is, uh, of course, a fundamental principle throughout medicine, which respects an individual's autonomy and is uh, uh, based on the assumption that uh, there can be an ob objective presentation of risks and benefits uh, before an individual agrees to undergo a procedure. Of course, this is routine for surgery. It would be unthinkable for us to take someone in for an appendectomy without uh, uh, informed consent being executed. But actually, it's qu quite rare for psychiatry. We do it, uh, of course, for things like electroconvulsive therapy, but actually relatively few other circumstances. This is important because it's now recommended that prior to clinical genetic testing, recommend most professional societies, that informed consent be provided. Uh, and, and yet, I don't think we have good mechanisms uh, for fulfilling this recommendation uh, within most uh, clinical psychiatric settings. Now, let me tell you a little bit about some of the, the kinds of tests that are available and what you might want to be thinking about uh, uh, either uh, discussing with your patients or maybe even using in the, in the near future. Uh, we know that psychiatric disorders are not monogenic. So unlike uh, conditions like Huntington disease, we can't point to a single gene that can be considered causal. They have very small impact on individual risk, generally in the order of 1 or 2 percent. What's not clear yet is whether large sets of genes that could be tested together could have a larger impact. When this has been done in research settings, published studies find area under the curves on the order of 55 to 65 percent. Now, when you order a prostate-specific antigen or uh, 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 cardiac enzymes for an individual who presents to the emergency room with, with chest pain, the area under the curves for those kinds of tests are generally well over 80 percent. So this is not within the realm that would be considered clinically useful, but it's a, still an open question whether larger samples with better information might actually push this higher. There's also uh, the important uh, issue of interaction with other factors, such as family history, which has so far uh, been relatively little studied in psychiatry. I mentioned the, the, the one example of uh, family history of Alzheimer disease in a first-degree relative and how important that was in the proper interpretation of the APOE result. Similar examples may exist for these kinds of tests, but they haven't generally been investigated. Now, there's a different situation when we look at uh, CNV testing. These, of course, are the small chromosomal deletions and duplications, which over the last five years have been found to be much more common in individuals with autism, schizophrenia, and maybe bipolar disorder than they are in individuals who are healthy. Now, individually, each one of these copy number variants is actually quite rare. Uh, they may occur in one or two in a thousand of the population. But there are so many of them that when they're taken together, they may count for about 5 percent of autism cases, something on the order of 3 to 5 percent of schizophrenia, and maybe about 1 to 2 percent of bipolar disorder, particularly bipolar disorder, uh, beginning early in life. So it's a uh, not uh, uh, entirely uh, insignificant proportion. Carriers of some of these CNVs may also be at risk for other medical conditions when the CNV causes a, what's called, known as a contiguous gene syndrome. And the best example of that is the velocardiofacial uh, deletion on chromosome 22, which is associated both with schizophrenia and with cardiac and other health problems. Now, there are also a variety of pharmacogenetic tests that, that uh, are, are available to clinicians. Um, most of these have no evidence of clinical utility yet in psychiatry, uh, 
but yet you may see them often promoted within uh, professional journals. Uh, the cytochrome P450 tests, which have been validly associated with metabolism of a variety of drugs, including psychotropic drugs, but where uh, studies have not found evidence of clinical utility, that is, knowing the information has not been shown to, to alter decision-making or outcomes. But more study is needed of this, particularly in situations such as treatment-resistant depression or in individuals with other atypical presentations or atypical reactions to antidepressants, because generally uh, the, the clinical utility has been evaluated only in typical uh, settings. Another uh, long-marketed test is that of the serotonin transporter. Uh, we've known for a long time that there is a, a polymorphism in this gene that influences how efficiently serotonin is taken up from the synapse. And you'll recall that it's direct blockade of the serotonin transporter that's thought to be an important part of the mechanism of the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So it seems, stands to reason that, that this uh, polymorphism could have an impact on individual response to antidepressants. But in fact, uh, after more than 10 years of study, uh, the jury is still out on, on whether uh, there's a, any consistent effect. And if there is, it's a small one. There's also been weak associations with a broad range of other symptoms uh, from anxiety uh, to uh, personality traits, which obviously complicates our ability to interpret uh, results in an individual situation. Others uh, that are marketed but yet have uh, been little studied for their clinical utility, uh, polymorphisms in this MTFHR. This was featured in the recent NOVA presentation I mentioned. Uh, the serotonin 2A receptor, it's actually uh, a, a, a genetic marker that we were involved in initial discovery, and BDNF, which has been widely studied in a variety of situations and which is thought to, to play a role in uh, the mechanism of antidepressant action. Now there are some uh, uh, pharmacogenetic tests that really are ready for prime time in psychiatry, even though they, they probably apply to drugs that we uh, fairly infrequently use. Uh, it's been discovered over the last couple of years that particular um, uh, genotypes in the uh, major histocompatibility locus, the HLA locus, uh, are associated with uh, severe adverse drug events, uh, things like Steven Johnson syndrome, which can actually be life-threatening. Uh, the initial discovery was that this uh, particular polymorphism, which is basically seen only in people of Asian ancestry, was associated with Stevens-Johnson and conferred a very high risk over tenfold in individuals who carried that. Uh, the FDA altered their labeling for carbamazepine to reflect this finding, and uh, uh, it's currently being evaluated whether use of this uh, test prior to carbamazepine treatment in people of Asian ancestry will actually reduce uh, the incidence of Stevens-Johnson syndrome. More recently, another uh, polymorphism known as HLAA3101 has been shown to be associated with similar adverse uh, skin events uh, in people uh, of a variety of ancestries, and so that might actually be more uh, directly relevant uh, in, in clinical settings with non-Asian patients. So psychiatrists should be aware of this. Uh, it, it's still not crystal clear uh, uh, whether uh, testing will prevent uh, these bad outcomes, and we don't often prescribe carbamazepine anymore, but it is occasionally used as an adjunct, particularly for uh, mood stabilizers. Other tests that have uh, gotten a lot of press recently, such as a, uh, a big paper in the New England Journal uh, back in January claiming a strong association between genetic markers and lithium response in Asians, uh, still await replication. Uh, and you remember I was saying earlier that clinical validity uh, uh, depends heavily on, on replication first. Uh, before we can really uh, evaluate clinical utility. Genetic counseling. This is also an area where in psychiatry we don't typically uh, think of, but where it might be actually increasingly important for us to have relationships with genetic counselors if we're offering uh, genetic tests to our patients. Of course, we're all taught that genetic counseling is ideally used before genetic testing, in order to evaluate its potential and anticipate results, to lay out potential scenarios for patients and make sure that they understand uh, what the genetic test can and can't reveal. Of course, it, it, genetic counseling is also useful for understanding results and secondary findings. 
Uh, but it's actually quite challenging when you consider most uh, settings in which psychiatric care is provided uh, to see how we're going to integrate traditional genetic counseling with psychiatric care, since there's really a need for both genetic and mental health expertise in doing that. Many genetic counselors don't feel entirely comfortable with the kinds of counseling issues that are presented by people with major mental illnesses, and many psychiatrists don't feel competent in presenting many of the actuarial uh, risks associated with genetic testing results. So we need to figure out how to bring together uh, these two areas uh, if, if we're going to really be providing responsible genetic testing uh, to psychiatric patients. Now another uh, a thorny issue that can arise whenever uh, more than a single genetic test is done is what's uh, referred to as incidental or secondary findings. This is particularly problematic for genome-wide tests uh, such as exome sequencing studies. And the idea here is that uh, uh, with any genome-wide test, you might find unanticipated genetic changes that have health significance. You might find, for example, one of those highly penetrant breast cancer mutations. You might find uh, uh, a polymorphism that substantially increases an individual's risk uh, for other uh, preventable disorders uh, down the road. Um, in general, then, uh, a plan is needed for identifying these incidental findings, for reporting them back to the patient, and for providing adequate counseling. And uh, several organizations, such as the American College of Medical Genetics, have provided some guidelines on this. When they were issued last fall, they were actually quite controversial uh, because they, they seemed to create a new uh, uh, duty of reporting and, and, and of dealing with genetic information that many physicians are still uncomfortable with. Uh, so this is an area that even in psychiatry we, we, we now uh, are faced with, uh, and uh, we have to think about how we deal, for example, with a depressed patient uh, who's had an exome sequence study, and on top of their depression has now learned that they carry uh, uh, a mutation in the BRCA gene that may require uh, prophylactic mastectomy uh, down the road. So these are really very thorny issues uh, that, that we in psychiatry are not uh, used to dealing with. This is a, a chart that uh, I uh, found on the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia website that actually lays out some of uh, the kinds of incidental findings that can come up typically in an exome study. I talked about uh, these high-risk, medically actionable findings, and these were the findings that the ACMG focused on. Um, these are conditions that uh, could have a high impact on an individual's health or on the health of their close relatives and where preventive strategies can be applied, such as breast cancer. Then there are also high risk, not medically actionable. These are even more problematic, things like uh, uh, being homozygous for the APOE4 allele. Uh, and uh, knowing then that an individual is at substantially increased risk of Alzheimer's disease, but without any uh, preventive treatment that can be applied. Incidental findings can also uh, apply to drug response, carrier status for conditions that may only uh, be penetrant in uh, homozygous individuals. And then the, the, this broad range of these low or medium risk common disease variants, uh, which in general uh, people have not considered. Uh, within the realm of incidental finding reporting duties, uh, but which will, over time, I think, uh, complicate the edges of what's a, a medically actionable result. So uh, I think you've probably got a sense from what I've said so far that we, we, we're uh, getting to the point where the technology has perhaps outpaced uh, uh, the education both of, of clinicians and patients. Uh, I know when I was in medical school uh, about 25 years ago, uh, we, we thought we were getting uh, cutting edge um, genetic education, but we were taught very little uh, about actually how to, uh, to explain a genetic test to a patient and how to uh, use those uh, results in, in, in planning treatment. Uh, probably because very little was known then, and we're still in a situation where uh, what we know about these tests and, uh, uh, and how to use them is, is very limited. This might be especially true for psychiatrists, uh, 
who, who often uh, uh, are working in a specialty where uh, genetics seems like a, a relatively peripheral concern, even though we recognize that most major psychiatric disorders are highly familial. I mentioned already that genetic counseling is not the same as mental health counseling, and that in order to provide competent genetic counseling, a uh, psychiatrist will, may need to know a lot more about genetics than we typically do. Of course, the other important thing is that the indications for genetic testing are often not clear. Uh, some of the, uh, the widely marketed tests for, for example, antidepressant response often uh, uh, talk about situations where patients have failed to respond to typical antidepressant treatment, uh, who have so-called treatment-resistant depression, or who have suffered adverse events on usual doses of, of, of medications. But it's really actually not very clear uh, whether uh, genetic information in those kinds of patients can actually be used to more intelligently pick uh, the next treatment uh, for that kind of patient. And that's a real problem because we don't really know when we should use a test. On the other hand, patients often have very little understanding of genetics. And surveys have consistently found that uh, uh, the public overestimates the importance of genetic findings, equating uh, a genetics with destiny or thinking in terms of the the one-to-one -one causal relationships for Mendelian diseases that are actually quite different uh, than what we're generally talking about when we consider clinical genetic testing in psychiatry. It can be very difficult to, to, to explain to individuals, particularly in the context of a mental health crisis, um, how uh, uh, the, the much more nuanced information that comes from a genetic test uh, might be useful in evaluating their condition or planning their care. There's also the, the concept of the genetic risk factor uh, can be easily misunderstood uh, because people don't think generally in terms of statistical risk or actuarial risk uh, in, in terms of their, their health or their long-term well-being. And it's actually, actually rather difficult to explain to an individual uh, that, that a, a particular test result increases their, their risk for a future outcome by 5, 10, or 15 percent. Surveys have consistently found that people actually have a very poor uh, uh, intuitive feel for what that means. Of course, we need a lot more research to answer a lot of these questions. And um, it's worth noting that this important clinical validity, that is, how reliably a genetic marker is associated with a disorder is still uncertain for most genetic tests that are used in psychiatry. We still need replication in large samples for most of these findings. And also, we need to know the universe over which these findings are valid. And remember, clinically valid gene tests may still lack clinical utility. They may not really have an impact on the way you can manage a patient and on the outcomes of your treatment. Effect sizes may be too small to have much of an impact, and the gene test may provide little unique information. For example, someone presents to the clinic with a psychotic episode, and they have a strong family history of schizophrenia. That probably is much more informative in your differential diagnosis than any of the genetic tests that you could do now uh, uh, that would uh, implicate a specific genetic lesion in that individual. So, it's not clear yet whether we have any genetic tests, particularly in psychiatry, that do better than a good family history. Finally, there's the question about whether genetic testing might actually do harm to patients. We're all taught first do no harm. And little is known about how psychiatric patients deal with genetic test results, particularly those that might have potentially serious health implications. There have actually been a few studies of uh, genetic test results information being given back to patients in a variety of settings, not psychiatric patients. And it seems reassuringly uh, that it doesn't seem to do much harm. There was one study that was published last fall in the American Journal of Psychiatry, which suggested, interestingly, that when people were told that they carried the APOE4 allele, the, that allele that's associated with Alzheimer's disease, they tended to underestimate their, uh, their memory performance, even though objectively their memory was no worse than uh, matched uh, peers who did not carry that, uh, that allele. So uh, 
I guess that's a harm in some ways. That it, it's shaken an individual's confidence in, in their memory abilities. But I think more importantly, what that study raises is the question about whether, particularly in the realm of, uh, of, uh, of behavioral and mental health, uh, whether there may be uh, subtle harms uh, from uh, uh, genetic testing that will be actually very difficult to carefully evaluate, except in uh, uh, the right populations and with the right sample sizes. And we still don't know much about the long-term effects of, of this kind of genetic knowledge 10 or 20 years out and what kinds of changes in behavior uh, this kind of information has. So to try to address these things and not get too far behind the curve, um, the International Society of Psychiatric Genetics, which is the, the major uh, research organization uh, for psychiatric genetics, uh, put together some uh, guidelines uh, in 2008 and 2009 uh, through a task force. And at the time, uh, there was a broad recommendation against all genetic testing, with the, the exception of these very well-established tests, such as PKU, Fragile X, and Huntington disease, which in, in, in reality are rarely used by psychiatrists. Um, it became clear to us, though, particularly with the advent of direct-to-consumer genetic testing, that we needed a more comprehensive uh, statement on the issue. So in uh, 2012 and 13, we put together a, a second uh, task force to update the recommendations in light of recent research. Interestingly, we couldn't come to consensus on it, however, and uh, the draft recommendations from the task force were actually not adopted by the Board of the Society, so they never ma made it uh, into the light of day. So we went back to the drawing board in the fall of 2013 uh, and decided to crowdsource the work to a large group of members in, in the society. We have about 40 or 50 people on the task force now from all over the world. It's very challenging to do a conference call when you have someone in Sydney, Australia, and Vancouver, British Columbia. There's no time that you can do it where someone doesn't have to get up very early or stay up very late. But it's a representation, I think, of, a, a, of how much interest there is in this issue around the world. So we did a series of conference calls aiming at a broad consensus, and we came up with final recommendations that were actually adopted by the board just recently, and which are now posted on our website. If you want to look at these in detail, uh, that's the, uh, the, the web address. We're also planning to uh, publish a, uh, a peer-reviewed scholarly review um, in one of the psychiatric journals in the coming year. But let me give you a quick rundown of the recommendations, just to get a feel for where we stand right now in terms of expert opinion on this subject. First of all, uh, the task force recommended that genetic tests should only be carried out if patients have given informed consent. And th that's problematic for many of the direct consumer tests, and also is not necessarily routinely done uh, in psychiatric settings. The task force felt that for major adult psychiatric disorders, such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, et cetera, single genetic variants are not sufficient, and there are no genetic tests that can establish a diagnosis or predict individual risk. And this is actually quite a strong consensus among the members of the task force, even given the, the large literature on genetic risk factors for these disorders. The task force felt differently about copy number variants which, as I mentioned, have been identified in people with autism spectrum disorders or schizophrenia, since these may help diagnose rare conditions with important medical and psychiatric implications and could also have implications for, uh, for families. Um, many times when individuals present with the onset of schizophrenia, uh, it's, it's, a, it's puzzling and, and frightening to the family without any explanation of why this occurred. Identification of a causative CNV, therefore, might actually help explain an individual case, and also has implications for the genetic risk in siblings and offspring if that's a, uh, uh, a, an inherited or a de novo event in that family. The task force also felt that clinicians should consider evolving pharmacogenetic testing recommendations and treatment decisions. The idea here was this is really fast moving. Uh, psychiatrists need to know about uh, uh, the association with HLA and carbamazepine, but there may be others that uh, very, very soon down the line will come out. And there's actually a nice uh, uh, registry of these kinds of tests that's available on the FDA website. 
and also the FDA labeling can be uh, helpful guidance. But the, the, the group felt that uh, evidence remained quite inconclusive as to the possible clinical utility of this cytochrome P450 testing, uh, but that more research is needed, particularly in those specialized situations I mentioned earlier. There were four more recommendations. Uh, one, that all genetic tests with health implications should be accompanied by professional genetic counseling. This was meant to address the issue of direct-to-consumer testing, but also uh, to alert clinicians to the need uh, for having genetic counseling resources available when they use genetic tests. Uh, the task force also felt that patients who have psychiatric illness or for tests that relate to psychiatric conditions, counselors should possess clinical expertise in mental health or at least work in a context where that expertise is immediately available. The task force, whoops, the task force talked about genome-wide testing and the possibility of incidental or secondary findings and recommended that, that this possibility should be clearly communicated prior to the testing and that procedures should be uh, in place for dealing with such findings and should be made explicit with patients beforehand warning people, gee, we might find something you don't expect, and this is how we'll deal with it. Uh, the task force advocated better education of mental health professionals in genetic medicine, and also a need to safeguard privacy of individuals' genetic testing results and reduce the stigma in the community. Uh, uh, we, we have legislation in place in the U.S. that protects individuals from uh, their genetic testing results being used against them, for example, in provision of health insurance, but that information can still be uh, requested uh, prior to a, a life insurance policy, for example, or in evaluation of premiums for long-term care insurance, and that's still a, a, a concern when genetic testing is done. And finally, the task force called for expanded research efforts to clarify the role of genetic testing in psychiatry. I should say this initially said to clarify the utility, if any, of genetic testing in psychiatry. Uh, but the, we, we were able to reach a broader consensus by, by writing this a little bit more generally. So that's the, the current uh, state of expert opinion on this matter. And so you can find this on our website. Uh, you may agree or disagree with it, but it represented a broad consensus of the field at the moment. So in conclusion, uh, genetic testing is becoming a reality in psychiatry, uh, uh, like it or not. And uh, clinicians and patients are, are going to need to deal with an increasing onslaught uh, of, of genetic data and genetic claims uh, in the near future. Despite that, the clinical utility of psychiatric genetic tests is generally limited or unknown. The use of certain genetic tests in specific situations may be warranted, such as CNV testing in the first onset of a schizophrenia or autism. But there's a need for more genetic education, both of clinicians and patients, so that we know when to order tests and how to interpret the results properly for patients. And we need uh, additional research to better understand the landscape uh, that, that, that uh, we're, we're working in, especially in psychiatric genetics, and how we can use uh, genetic tests to alter treatment in positive ways. And that's all I have for the moment, and I'd be happy to take questions. Okay, so two questions. How does the serotonin transporter linked polymorphic region, the LPR, relate to the risk of depression? Uh, and, and that's been very widely studied uh, uh, with uh, collectively thousands of, of, of patients around the world, and I think the answer is still ambiguous. <laughs> um, there seems to be an ancestry-based difference, so that one allele uh, seems to slightly increase risk of depression in people of European ancestry but the work in the opposite direction in individuals of Asian ancestry. And I think most people feel that probably what this is telling us is that uh, the genetic context matters a lot 
and probably matters more than the variation of that individual marker. Uh, that doesn't mean it's not a great thing to study in the laboratory uh, because it really does get very close to um, the mechanism of a lot of antidepressants. But as a clinical test, it's, it, it, it's just not there and probably never will be. The other question is, uh, what does the recent research tell us about the genetic differences between the major uh, mental illnesses? And what I can say about that is that so far uh, from the genome-wide association studies, which look at common genetic variants that uh, have a small impact on risk, uh, that there's a lot of overlap, uh, substantial overlap between bipolar disorder and schizophrenia, and some overlap as well between major depression and those two conditions, and even some overlap with things we wouldn't think of as really being in the same spectrum, such as autism and, uh, and ADHD. Uh, I don't know exactly what that means, uh, but I, I think the, pre the prevailing opinion is that probably at this point we're picking up uh, genes that have very general impact on brain development and morphology, and that uh, uh, deviations from the ideal uh, along those lines may actually put individuals at risk for a range of conditions depending on their individual life circumstances and other risk factors. Um, the story could change a lot, though, as we, uh, as we start to look at these less common markers that, that play a larger impact in, in these, such as uh, these CNVs, because they seem to be uh, more narrowly defined in, in their diagnostic range, although there is substantial in, in overlap there between CNVs that confer risk for autism and schizophrenia, a lot of the same. Uh, and uh, with bipolar disorder, it seems that they're, they're, they tend to be smaller but that the, they involve many of the same genes. You commented on a publication recently of a Belgian journal, Blocker, that seemed to diagnose schizophrenia and depression. I think it's published in the same week. Uh, calcium channel gene, you mean? Yes, yeah. So uh, one of the, the, these overlapping genes, and one of the first that was identified by the Gene Wide Association Studies is this gene uh, CACNA1C that uh, encodes a voltage-gated calcium channel that is clearly important in membrane potential in the brain. Uh, it, common variations in that gene have been associated with both bipolar disorder and schizophrenia pretty robustly, and, uh, uh, but with an odds ratio on the order of 1.1. So uh, I think this gives us perhaps more insight into mechanism than it does in diagnosis. Uh, but it, it does seem to uh, fit with a, a growing story uh, that, that calcium signaling in the brain is probably important, particularly in bipolar disorder. Is there potential that this technology just might just assist us in seeing the patient with regard to uh, the underlying mental health issue and, and Yes, yeah, so can we use genetic testing to sort of sort out underlying bipolar illness and prevent uh, a, a bad outcome when we use antidepressants? The answer right now is no, but we would, we would dearly love to have that kind of a test. Um, one experiment that hasn't been done, however, is to, to, to use these aggregate of, of uh, uh, tests of common variation across the genome and see how well that differentiates individuals uh, with depression and bipolar disorder. One study did suggest that, that individuals who have first degree relatives with bipolar disorder tend to have higher scores uh, uh, genetically for bipolar disorder, uh, and people with, who, whose relatives only have depression uh, have lower scores. Uh, but of course, you could learn that by just doing a good family history. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so the, these, the, these conditions, the Asperger's in particular falls into this range of the autism spectrum disorders, and uh, that's not routinely uh, genetically tested in most, uh, in most university medical centers, probably less so in the community. Uh, and th there is a strong association with these same um, rare copy number variants that are seen in autism. Uh, 
not as hard uh, because HHS was concerned about the enforcement test and would like the information to be clear out there. What's the clinical validity and clinical utility? So we have all those fields, and people feel very strongly, should we house those uh, on an NIH site? Because that gives us kind of a feeling, well, the rest of this is okay. If it's on an NIH site, we really have to show this. Um, you know, versus just sort of ticking them off, uh, and yet then there's no place for people to really come and see, well, what's the evidence? Yes. It's a thorny issue, and it's actually an area where we had the, some of the greatest difficulty in reaching consensus on the task force. Uh, m most of the task force members ha felt fairly strongly against direct consumer testing, but there was a, an important subset who thought that um, uh, we shouldn't be too paternalistic, and we ought to respect uh, uh, individuals' rights to learn their genetic information themselves and, uh, and to be empowered. Um, to, to uh, discuss that information with their, uh, their uh, clinicians uh, on an equal basis. And it's, it's hard to, to argue that that shouldn't happen. <laughs> so it really is, uh, uh, I think, comes down to uh, trying, if we're going to let the information out, let's give all the information and make sure people really understand uh, the complexities involved, the very, very small risks and uh, that, that, that these uh, markers uh, confer, or the very small effect sizes they have in terms of treatment outcomes, um, and try to have the conversation. So personally, I think you're right to, to put these tests on your website uh, in the context of the information that's there, and to highlight in particular when we don't have uh, clinical validity, uh, much less clinical utility. <laughs> Uh, um, many of these tests exist just as, as, as an individual reports uh, in, in, in a journal. Yeah, but it's a, it's a tough area. <laughs> yeah. Alteration of the gene, if that becomes available, then it's very, very important. Supposing somebody has a family history of hemophilia, whatever, and they can see that that gene can be altered in that adult so that the next generation will not get the disease. I think that can be done possibly. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so if I, if I understand what you're saying is this idea of people ought to know what risks they, they, they might pose to, to subsequent generations, um, and, the, and can genetic information be used for that? And in, I'd say that in most cases for psychiatric disorders, we, we can't do that, unfortunately. Uh, but there are uh, some rare instances where someone carries a, a well-established pathogenic copy number variant, uh, and that if they reproduce, they will have a 50 percent chance of passing that on to their offspring, and then their offspring who inherits it will be at a 10 to 20-fold increased risk of illness. We can talk about that, and, uh, uh, and I think it would be helpful to know that, but that's about one in a thousand patients. So what, what we really need is, is, is to be able to have that kind of conversation with the majority of patients. And that the, the way that's based now, you, you, you probably have these conversations yourselves, is we say, well, if we look at the family study data, we can say that you know, if you have schizophrenia, your offspring will have about 10 percent risk of the illness, the same as about true for bipolar disorder. And so most of your kids will be fine. Yeah. But that's often not very satisfying to individual patients. But when therapy becomes available, it will be of great consequence. Absolutely. If we could, if we could say who's at the greatest risk. You know, and what about situations where you have a family where, where maybe a parent has, say, bipolar disorder, and um, uh, among the kids, w one of them is starting to have behavioral issues in their, their teens. It would be great to know uh, whether that's the bipolar illness presenting early and should be treated as such, or whether it's something else. And uh, if we had uh, uh, highly specific genetic tests, we could do that. Uh, I just don't see that on the horizon. So if you still believe 
Uh, yeah, so the idea is that the importance of family history in psychiatry and other fields. And let me tell you, this is, I have a whole talk on this <laughs> issue <laughs> where I try to impress on residents that they need to learn how to do family histories and make it part of their routine practice. And that if it's done right, it actually doesn't need to be that time consuming, uh, but that the, the information they obtain is, is, is so valuable. Um, I think it's very striking how often people don't know uh, about a family history, uh, uh, particularly of psychiatric disorders. Um, suicide in the family is, is yeah, uh, so suicide is often not talked about. Uh, people have had accidental or unexplained deaths, for example. Uh, they might know they had a, an uncle or aunt who was institutionalized, but they don't know the details. So um, I think that's also part of our education and destigmatization process is to teach young people, ask your relatives about their health, understand what they've got, uh, because it could be relevant for your own health down the road. And, and the enormous interest in things like direct-to-consumer genetic testing and genealogy, et cetera, it shows that people really are interested in this. We just need to help them channel it. Yeah, so does family history help us with, with treatment decisions? Yeah, I, I think common sense tells us it must. Uh, the, the empirical data on this in psychiatry is limited, but there have been a couple of papers suggesting that, that um, SSRI response might be familial and that lithium response is probably uh, pretty strongly familial. Uh, uh, but everything that's familial is not genetic, uh, but, but the familiality might be, might be helpful when, when you're choosing from a variety of equally effective drugs uh, in, in choosing one for a particular patient. It's also helpful, I, I, as you I'm sure know, that if, if, if somebody's brother or sister has had a drug and it responded well to it, uh, that, that creates positive expectations uh, that, that can be useful in, in motivating a patient to take that drug and stay on it until it works. In the treatment. So does genetic testing have any bearing on the treatment of Asperger's? As far as I'm aware, uh, uh, it does not. However, um, it may very well uh, be known in the near future that individuals who have autism spectrum disorders that are associated with particular CNVs uh, will have a, a particular course of their illness and might respond uniquely to certain drugs. That's certainly being evaluated right now in a couple of ongoing studies. There's a large study at CHOP that's looking at this and another uh, uh, in Iceland uh, run by DECODE, uh, but the, the data is not in yet. Yes, that, well, thanks for the opportunity to say that. <laughs> um, we, in, in, in my uh, group, we study two uh, things in particular. We're interested in, in large families with bipolar disorder uh, for uh, sequencing studies that, that are ongoing. Um, and we, we particularly like families where we can compare first or second cousins uh, because that tends to be genetically very powerful. Uh, an another area that might be particularly relevant to your own clinical practice is that we're quite interested in looking for uh, the uh, genetic risk factors for treatment-resistant depression. And we're putting together uh, panels of, of individuals who have failed two antidepressant trials. Often these are people who present for electroconvulsive therapy, uh, doing uh, exome sequencing on them and looking for unique or rare variants that might explain uh, the, the failure of existing treatments uh, to work for their depression. These kinds of studies need fairly large samples, so I'm always delighted to talk with you if you have uh, patients who might fall into those, one of those categories and what we could do uh, to, to enroll them in the research project. Certainly. How was it? Oh, good. <laughs>